Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have Professor Prem Kumar from Northwestern University. Uh, he is a professor there uh, in information technology in the McCormick School of Engineering. Uh, Professor Kumar's research is focused on quantum photonic devices in applications in quantum information networks, um, high precision measurements, imaging and sensing, optical communication. Uh, Professor Kumar was a program manager at DARPA uh, during 2013 to 2017, and at 2015 he was selected as the program manager of the 2015. He was selected as the program manager of the year. Uh, he is a fellow of various organizations, including OSA, APS, IEEE, uh, AAS, and SPI. So let's welcome Professor Kumar. Thank you, Arka. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? I think everything is good, right? All right. Uh, so first of all, my thanks to the organizers, to Kaime, to Arka, for facilitating this visit. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about uh, quantum switching in the context of uh, quantum networking. Uh, as you know, there is a, a big initiative underway. Uh, if everything goes through in Congress, uh, there'll be a a lot of investments made in the quantum information science and technology area. Uh, and the work I'm presenting here uh, has its roots uh, actually dating back to my time before the DARPA days. So some of the work I'll be showing here uh, is not as recent, but uh, the problem that we're addressing is still unique in the sense that uh, uh, there is very little follow-up work on that. Uh, so, without further ado, let's uh, move on. And I know this is meant to be a colloquium, so I'm going to start out targeting the students uh, and uh, bring you on to see what is quantum networking, first of all, or what is quantum communication before we actually get to quantum networking. And just to lay the land, uh, this is uh, the focus towards the end will be on uh, switching. And uh, this is sort of the outline. I will motivate it, show you uh, a particular device uh, that we built, how it can do quantum switching. Uh, I'll define what we mean by quantum switching, and then uh, some applications that we have demonstrated in, in, in recent years and some future outlook on that. And you can uh, prototypically imagine these switches to be like railroad switches, uh, metaphorically and conceptually. Okay, so for the students, just to uh, bring you on board in terms of terminology, what is the difference between classical and quantum communications? So what is uh, shown here uh, is a register. This, in the context of classical communication, two users, Alice and Bob. And these could be your cell phones. These could be your uh, devices that you communicate with these today. Uh, this is a register in that device contains uh, made up of classical bits that can be in states 0 and 1. And a string of these bits constitutes a message. That message needs to be communicated to Bob, so the sender and the receiver, or transmitter and the receiver. And uh, in the end, the goal is for Bob to have a register in his device uh, containing that same information that Alice possessed, hence to form the, the communication. Long ago, back uh, in the 19, late 1940s, uh, Claude Shannon actually showed that irrespective of this communication channel, it was always possible to obtain error-free communication below a certain channel capacity. This is a very powerful argument that he had made. It took almost 50 years to to find the communication codes that we practice today, almost error-free communications globally. Uh, and you know, many of you are using that internet connectivity now and this talk being live broadcast. So we asked the question, uh, what if these registers were now quantum registers in the sense that each of these red dots is a quantum bit which can not only be in states 0 and 1, but also can be in some superposition. Could that state from Alice of that register be communicated to Bob? Uh, if that's possible, then this could be a quantum communication channel and 
Can, is that possible? And if you give a few minutes of thought, you find that that kind of a straightforward, naive generalization is, uh, is not quite right. It has conflicts with fundamental laws of quantum mechanics. It violates no cloning theorem in the sense that if uh, there was one qubit here uh, or a string of qubits and then you have a same string of qubits here, you violate this no cloning theorem because you have two copies. And you ask, okay, what if I measure and resend in the sense of like fax machines, you measure and resend or your Star Trek transportation. Uh, that also is not quite possible because Heisenberg uncertainty principle limits you from measuring a quantum state. So it is not possible to actually recreate that. So this seemed like an unsolvable problem. However, uh, back in the 90s, in 1993, this paper appeared by Bennett. This is Charlie Bennett, who has uh, uh, many noteworthy accomplishments in this field, and a whole bunch of collaborators. They showed this so-called qubit teleportation protocol. This protocol uh, requires an additional resource, a resource of what we call entanglement. So if Alice and Bob pre-share another resource, uh, an entangled pair of bits, shown here as in the singlet state, uh, so T here is transmitter, R is receiver, so they have a joint state, one qubit in the possession of Alice, and one qubit in the possession of Bob, but this is part of an entangled state. And what they showed was that if Alice wants to transmit a particular qubit to Bob, then she takes her half of the entangled bit and jointly measures that with the qubit that she wants to transmit. And that joint measurement, it's on two qubit. Uh, two qubits leads to a, a four, one of four possible choices, two classical bits of information that she classically transmits to Bob. And if you follow the whole protocol, then Bob is able to actually transform his half of the entangled qubit by use of that information into exactly the state that Alice had. In the process of this joint measurement in these so-called Bell states, uh, she loses all information about the qubit that she had in her possession. So essentially, this teleportation protocol forms a link between Alice and Bob. That qubit uh, uses that pre-shared entanglement to do a, a communication at some desired later time. And then a lot of uh, work has gone on in this in demonstrating this. Uh, so this quantum communication over the years has turned into an entanglement distribution network. Uh, so people are after, uh, when you think about a quantum network, it has to have a layer of this entanglement distribution. And sources or the entanglement factories that people think about must have some desirable properties. Uh, and one of them is that if there are lots of people on this network doing quantum communication, there should be copious amounts of it being generated. That means that uh, there should be lots of efficient sources that produce entanglement and distribute to Alice and Bob pairs on the network. Not only that, in the process of distribution, your state must not degrade. So these are actually quite stringent requirements, but a lot of work has gone on in facilitating that. And I want to give you a little bit of a sense of where we are, uh, and then make the case for why uh, switching is desirable in this context. OK. So, there is a, a lot of work has been progressed, and I'll give you one uh, example. But in this kind of a scenario, uh, there is a bottleneck. And that bottleneck is of this so-called rate distance bottleneck. And this comes from the fact that as these entangled pairs of photons are traversing distance, uh, there is loss in the way uh, that if you, if you distribute them over fiber, then there is an inevitable small loss in uh, versus distance in the fiber. If you do it in free space, the same thing holds. And due to diffraction, unless your aperture is really, really big, uh, you suffer losses. So that means that uh, the distance actually is limited. But that problem in the context of classical communication was solved by using optical amplifiers. And in the quantum 
optics quantum information community, we still lack equivalent of an optical amplifier, what we, community we call the quantum repeaters, and we still lack those devices. But in recent years, uh, satellite-based approaches have been shown, uh, in fact, by our Chinese colleagues. Uh, and so if you have a trusted satellite, it turns out that you can overcome this rate distance bottleneck. And they've done some really hero experiments in this field. And I'll uh, briefly describe one of those. Um, but if you look at the overall landscape of uh, how these entanglement factories are, are being envisioned, there are systems that are based on various different physical uh, underlying physical modalities. Uh, the workhorse from the beginning has been this, what's called SPDC, or spontaneous parametric down conversion. Uh, and then uh, uh, my work over the years has focused on this spontaneous flow of mixing, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And in the context of quantum memories and repeaters, uh, you know, some ensemble-based work, which I will not really go into. And so coming back to this first kind of uh, entanglement distribution uh, source and uh, the system to distribute entanglement was this uh, uh, experiment that was announced in 2017. Uh, so in 2015, uh, China launched this satellite called Misius. It goes around the Earth. And um, in this satellite is an entanglement source. And this entanglement source actually was developed in the US as part of uh, a program funded by the US government back in 2006 in the group of Franco Wong uh, at MIT. And this is a, a, a phase, this is a type two spontaneous parametric down conversion. Again, I don't have the time to go into the details, but if somebody's interested, I can explain how this thing works. The bottom line is that they have these two uh, collimators that capture these entangled photon pairs. And this geometry is very, very phase stable. So as the satellite goes around, uh, it is able to make uh, links with the, uh, uh, sorry. It is able to make uh, links with uh, two stations. Uh, and then they were, in this paper, they managed to show Bell's inequality violation over 1,200 kilometers. And that certainly would not be possible if you tried to do that directly on the Earth. Uh, the record uh, for these kind of things is uh, maybe 300, 400 kilometers at best with rates that are much, much smaller than what they demonstrated in, in this kind of an experiment. So that showed that uh, uh, you know, global reach of entanglement distribution is possible. And they utilize that entanglement distribution to demonstrate uh, uh, this uh, uh, Bell's inequality violation. OK, so moving on uh, to the case uh, uh, with spontaneous forward mixing kind of sources, which are more suited for fiber optic uh, entanglement distribution. And that's where uh, my work has been since for the last 20 years or so. In fact, uh, early on in the late 90s, we'd been looking at uh, parametric nonlinearity in fibers. Our goal at the time was. I mentioned erbium amplifiers, they, have a, they provide gain in fiber optic systems over a very limited bandwidth, uh, about 40 nanometers around 15, 50 nanometers. And if you wanted to, at the time, of course, uh, there was bandwidth glut. But as we've seen, that, uh, that bandwidth glut has uh, really evaporated. And people are looking for more and more bandwidth for optical long, long haul communications or even in you know, data centers and so forth. Our interest was to look at the process of uh, forward mixing to see if you can get a uh, very wide bandwidth operation. And uh, again, I'm going to bypass a number of, uh, for, for the sake of time, uh, in a, in a uh, series of papers, we showed that if you pump this kind of a fiber near the zero dispersion point, uh, that these spontaneously, you get this modulation instability sidebands. And if you analyze these sidebands, what you find is that there is a spontaneous four photon scattering process that goes on, which is very similar to this spontaneous parametric down conversion I talked about that's kind of captured in this logo here. So instead of one photon coming in and interacting with the medium through its nonlinearity, uh, spontaneously, 
splitting into two photons here, two pump photons from this injected light, they interact with the third order nonlinearity and spontaneously scatter into a photon that's uh, upshifted and then another photon that's downshifted. And, and this is a non-degenerate process and there are various different uh, games one can play with this. And we established uh, in these early papers that this process is exactly identical to spontaneous parametric downconversion in terms of signals and idlers having the entanglement properties. And so here's a, uh, an example of turning that time energy entanglement, uh, and I didn't quite define what I mean by time energy entanglement, so essentially an entanglement that existed on that four photons spontaneous uh, scattering process what, what that means is that uh, when these two pump photons scatter, these two uh, signal idler photons, the one is that upshifted, the other is downshifted, they have same polarization properties. And one can utilize that and turn that entanglement into polarization entanglement, and, and the polarization entanglement is easy to measure, and that's the reason for turning that into a polarization entanglement. So if you imagine now, this is the sort of the diagram of a, a, a typical experiment. You have a fiber that's about 300 meters long. Again, these are typical numbers. Uh, and you can do it with 50 meters. You can do it with 500 meters. And you just pick some. Uh, and then if you pump it with a pulse of light uh, here shown, five picosecond transform limited pulse, that would have about one nanometer of bandwidth in the telecom band, just to give you some numbers. And if you polarize this pulse of light, diagonal relative to this uh, polarization beam splitter, uh, so half of the light travels clockwise, that will have horizontal polarization, and the other half will travel counterclockwise, that will have vertical polarization. And this method is very similar to the one that I mentioned before that exists in Missius, but the there, it's a second order nonlinear crystal periodically pulled lithium niobate or periodically pulled KTP as opposed to uh, a piece of fiber here. So, if this power of the pump is small enough that only one photon pair is generated, if it's generated clockwise, and there's a little bit of an animation here, it comes out and is detected by these detectors. But that's a probability amplitude for it being generated in the clockwise direction. Correspondingly, it could have been generated counterclockwise. If that happened, then it would have a polarization that is vertical. Uh, so, but now if you separate them, now if you separate them, uh, sorry, I'm having a hard time getting used to this cursor here. Uh, so if you separate them by their color, so one photon goes to one detector, the other photon goes to the other detector, and you insert polarization analysis uh, instrumentation in between, what you find is that uh, because there is only uh, one, photon is, one photon pair is scattered, uh, depending on what measurement you make, uh, it makes a difference. So for example, if you only look at one detector and rotate a polarizer in one channel relative to the other, you find that your single counts, shown on the, on, the, on the right here, do not change. And you can look at the single counts in the other one that do not change. But if you only look at the coincidence counts as you rotate the relative polarization between the two axes, you get this full visibility to photon interference. Okay, so this is a hallmark of entanglement. Uh, that uh, even though uh, in coincidence detection you measure the coincidence pair, but the moment one is measured, the other polarization, other photons polarization is, is dictated by that. And over the years, uh, uh, in fact, we carried out some entanglement distribution experiments. This goes back to 2006. So you create in the middle here a, a source of spontaneous forward mixing and tangled photon pair generation. You multiplex one of them uh, into a spool of fiber that has your standard communication channels here. Uh, so here's the eye pattern of uh, 10 gigabit per second communication being performed on that 50 kilometer spool of fiber. And another channel on the other side. 
And here's the channel plan. So this is the ITU grid. Uh, the entangled pair channel is over here, and classical channels are over here, and dictated by the availability of lasers we had. But the point is that even after 100 kilometer of distribution of these entangled photon pairs, you still could get high visibility two photon interference. If you compare this data with the data that's shown on the satellite, uh, this data is better. Okay, so that means that this kind of technology has existed for a very long time. It's just that it hasn't been engineered to the point of utilizing it for some purpose. So, and we even started a company, and this kind of a source is commercially being used. Uh, some of the networking testbed utilize this, these kind of uh, devices. Now let's look at uh, what this system uh, is and what is potentially possible. So that pulse that I showed you, uh, five picosecond in duration, the repetition rate of that laser, it's a mode-locked laser, was at 50 megahertz. And 50 megahertz, uh, and it turns out that to create one entangled photon pair, it requires in that, five, in that five picosecond pulse about 10 to the seven photons at that wavelength. If you turn that into a, a power requirement, that turns out to be only two milliwatts. So you're using only two milliwatts to pump that piece of fiber. And if I increase the repetition rate to 10 gigahertz, that scales to about 400 milliwatt. And if you then average how many <coughs> photon pairs per second are being generated, uh, that goes up to about 20 million photon pairs per second. But there's no technology that I can use to measure those 20 million photon pairs per second. Almost all detectors have dead times. Whether you have uh, uh, solid state uh, uh, avalanche photodiode based detectors or whether you have superconducting nanowire based detectors. They all are very good in timing resolution, but once an event is detected, they are dead for a long time. So that puts a limit on how fast the rate can be. So that makes a, a, a very good argument that you can have a source that produces entanglement but at a very high rate because in the end a user's use of that entangled photon pair will be dictated by their detectors. Uh, you need a switching technology that you can route these uh, photon pairs in different time slots to different users. And of course, whatever that technology is, has to be such that it does not produce too much of loss. Because if that produces loss in the middle, then your rate's going to go down, as I noted before. So it is in this context, uh, and here's another uh, view uh, that had been shown a while back uh, in the context of uh, uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion, that you can have multiple pairs and you detect one photon and you herald the other uh, and you need a, a switch yard to actually turn this kind of a, a multi-pair source or multi an array of these down converters uh, into a stream of single photons for uh, some kind of a quantum communication application. So all these switching requirements uh, are needed and how does one satisfy that? So, so coming back to uh, this issue of uh, Switching that is lossless, ultra-fast, no background, cheap, mass-producible. So it is in this context uh, that we wanted to design a, a switching fabric uh, that would have all these properties and, and be able to take a high-rate entanglement source and then distribute it to different users on a, some kind of a network. Okay, so what is that source? So, so let me give you a little bit of a background again for the students to, to define the terminology. And, and this is no different at this stage from any other switching technology that you may have seen in the context of classical switching. Uh, in fact, almost all switching fabrics dating back to the old telephony days uh, are, are very similar. So a switch has what we call a bar state and a cross state. And this, uh, uh, the cross state, there is some kind of a pump. Uh, I label this as pump, which allows the switch to go from the bar state to the cross state. And uh, of course, these are the properties that I mentioned before. And this pump can be classical or quantum. Uh, 
If this pump is classical, then we have a switch, but then as this input A and B switch from A to C to B to D to A to D and B to C, then it must preserve uh, whatever quantum signals are coming in at A and B. If let's say this signal on input A was entangled with some other degree of freedom not represented in these four ports, then as this switching occurs, that entanglement needs to be preserved. Okay, because then this could be a qubit of a register in somebody's quantum computer, and if you want to switch that, then that entanglement has to be preserved. So that turns out to be actually a very demanding requirement. And moreover, of course, uh, in going from A to B to C to D, there should be very little in-band loss. The noise, because these quantum signals are at most one photon, right? So there should not be not only loss, but there shouldn't be pump-induced some kind of a scattering mechanism that adds noise to the input signal, and there should be none. Okay, so these are turn out to be quite demanding requirements, and I want to show you a way to get, get around and create devices that look pretty promising. So in the end, the switch utilizes the same nonlinearity, the nonlinearity that's provided by this fiber, the nonlinearity of the fiber. So think of it as a Think of it as, a, as an interferometer, and sketched here as a Mach Zahn interferometer. So you have a, a quantum signal coming in uh, from the two ports here, uh, and then uh, this uh, light gray comes this way if there is nothing, no phase change here. But if you have a pump and this phase changes by pi, then these uh, two signals are crossed at the output. This is a very simple, uh, very simple a kind of a system that's very often used in interferometry of different kinds. Uh, of course, um, our goal is to have all those uh, advantages that I outlined in the previous slide. And what we do is to create a pump that satisfies all the different constraints that are required uh, for this to be stable, low loss, uh, and we choose instead of a Mach Zander configuration here, a Sonic loop configuration, because an input coming in here splits 50-50, and one half travels one way, the other half travels the other way, and if this fiber was vibrating or fluctuating, had perturbations on it, that's common mode, and it, it cancels out. So whether it's a switched output or non-switched output, it remains pretty stable. But that's not enough. As soon as a pump comes in and enters through this kind, some kind of a wavelength division multiplexer, it has to satisfy a, some very stringent requirements uh, for those properties to be satisfied. First of all, this pump uh, has to provide identical phases on all points of this single photon wave function that is entering. So that means that uh, this pump has to be multicolored. It has to be multipolarization. It has to have different group velocities so that this pump actually walks through this signal. So that means that the nonlinear phase shift that occurs, in this case, on the counterclockwise uh, side of the signal going through, is independent of position of that wave function in time. Okay? So if you do that, what you find is that you get a performance that looks very much similar to, to a, a line switch that I've shown here. And because of this walk-off, uh, as this pump pulse walks through this signal pulse coming in through here, uh, it's the pump energy and some effective length that determines uh, the overall nonlinear phase shift, irrespective of what your uh, timing constraints are. And moreover, you have to pick the wavelengths in the right way. Uh, because as I said, uh, these signals are at most one photon. And, and in probabilistic systems, uh, they have probability of a photon being there, which is a few percent. So that means that any scattering has to be even less than that. So we chose this pump to be in the telecom band to satisfy the energy requirements, because that's where only the amplifiers are available. And then we had to create the signal idler entangled photon pair to demonstrate the switch. Uh, 
at a wavelength that's on the anti-Stokes side. And what's shown here is the Raman scattering uh, spectrum in the fiber. So if you try to do this in the same C band with the signal and idler there, this Raman scattering will really swamp you. There's just no way to do any kind of quantum switching. But by, by shifting this quantum channel to this standard, what we call O band or the original band, where the zero dispersion of the standard SMF fiber is, we can create entanglement there. And since it's on the anti-Stokes side, there's hardly any evidence of Raman scattering there. So utilizing then a source in the O band, and again, this is kind of a dense diagram. Instead of using a Sarniak loop, uh, what is being done here uh, is, a, is a Faraday mirror at the end of a, a, a straight fiber. And I didn't mention before, we cool this fiber to bring the Raman scattering down. It, it's in a doer that sits at liquid nitrogen temperature. But you can imagine the same pump pulse coming in and the parameters for these are shown here. You pass them through a polarization dependent delay so that, uh, again, so that this, um, uh, this um, input pulse is split into two pieces, uh, horizontal and vertical. And as they go through on the way back, they are switched to, they are rotated by 90 degrees. And they sample, uh, again, the same path. So that means that if this fiber could be fluctuating or sitting at room temperature, you get more or less the same immunity to environmental perturbations as in that Sonic loop geometry. And here's the tomography of, uh, I didn't show you tomography data before, but here's the tomography of this entangled polarization entangled photon pair generated, in this case, at uh, signal at 1306.5 nanometers. And the other one at 1303.5 nanometers. So these are three nanometers apart. Uh, and these filters really have to be very, very good. Uh, that they uh, suppress all the pump light that's generated literally one and a half nanometers from those channels. And these filters have to reject 100 dB of rejection. So these are very stringent requirements that can be, can be satisfied. So anyway, you can see that the fidelity of this source not only is very, very good, but it's very stable because of the use of that Faraday mirror. You can turn it on and turn it off, and this is 60 hours of operation uh, over multiple days. And you can see initial entanglement fidelity, and as you go, it remains pretty, pretty stable. We use this kind of a, a source to demonstrate the switching. So here is, again, that source, uh, and we incorporate Somehow this, uh, yeah, we incorporate uh, this switch. So idler photon is our input. And we re retain the signal photon to do the tomography, either the idler photon being switched or not, and compare the two. And so first of all, here is uh, the details of what the switching contrast we can uh, obtain. So all you do is vary the pump pulse energy and you find that uh, the, the switching contrast actually is very, very good. So 200 to 1 switching contrast. And similarly, uh, if you use different lengths of fiber or put a relative delay between the pump and the signal uh, or that idler photon that's being switched, uh, putting that relative pump delay, you can, you can vary your switching window. And it turns out because these pulses walk through each other, switching window is in the end dictated by the length of the fiber. So the group delay between the two pump light and the signal light is two picosecond per meter. So that means that uh, 500 meters of fiber will give you one nan about 800 picoseconds, uh, 850 picoseconds of uh, uh, the switching window. And, and you, know, you can go down to as small as 40, 50 picoseconds, and I'll show you some data on that. And the important point here is that you compare the tomography that's done on the photon, the idler photon being switched or not switched. And you can hardly de decipher any difference between the two. So what this says is that this kind of a switch, appropriately engineered, is capable of doing very fast switching uh, of quantum signals. So here I've only shown you that the entanglement of that photon that is switched with the signal photon that we have retained does not change whether you use the switch or not. And 
Uh, next, I will show you uh, uh, this promise that uh, this photon could be entangled with something else, and yet this kind of a switch can be used in a, in a quantum communication system. So, but before I, I uh, go there, I want to show you uh, some remarks. So here is a, a full crossbar version that we had built by using two circulators. Now you can come in with A and B. You can go straight or you can switch them. And in this case, we only use 20 meters of fiber, so it's a, fifth, a 40 picosecond switching window. So that means that you can use this with quantum signals that arrive at like 25 gigahertz rates. So as I said before, uh, because the nonlinearity of the fiber is pretty very fast, uh, you can have a very high rate switching devices. The theory behind of, uh, 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 these kind of uh, switches is well known. Uh, in fact, uh, much of the theoretical work uh, in uh, scattering of uh, you know, full wave mixing, uh, four photon scattering or Raman scattering in fibers uh, has been developed since the early 80s uh, in the context of squeeze state generation and other quantum light generation in fibers. And uh, uh, one can apply that to the problem of switching in this context. And I, as I said, uh, if you look in this paper, the, com the agreement between the theory uh, derived these expressions and the experimental data actually is very good. And I don't have time here to go into the details here. So I want to show you that this kind of a switch actually can be used in some kind of a networking environment. So, so a prototypical system uh, use of this kind of a switch could be something like this. I want to aggregate data from different users. And user one is creating a quantum state shown here, psi one. And I will define what the psi one is. And a user two, only 100 picoseconds, in this case, 300 picoseconds away, uh, is creating a quantum state that's different. And so let's call this channel one with psi one, channel two with psi two. And uh, now, of course, uh, you can come in with this kind of a signal on this switch, and you relatively delay the pump pulse. Uh, you can route uh, channel one to one port and channel two to the other port, shown here in this. So if you change the relative delay, you create in this uh, about 200 picoseconds uh, or 100 picosecond window here in which uh, one channel is going to one port, the other channel is going to the other port. So this is a quantum version of an eye diagram that we talk about in classical communication system, but except this is in the coincidence measurements, okay? So this is a, a quantum eye, and one can then use this to show that actually you can route these signals to different users while maintaining and preserving entanglement. So that's, uh, let's, let me show you how that experiment would work. So user one has psi one, which is this HH plus VV state. If you do quantum tomography on this, polarization tomography, you get these four pillars at these edges. And it looks, uh, uh, as I've shown you before, user two has the singlet state, edges minus VV state. If you do tomography on this, these off diagonal elements are flipped. Now, if these two signals come together and you use your ordinary single photon detectors that cannot resolve this 100, 300 picosecond timing duration, if they happen to measure the whole thing, you will get this kind of a coincidence uh, polarization tomography result. You have two channels that are incoherent with each other, and if you measure them, uh, you have an incoherent superposition, and your fidelity is pretty bad. Now, that's the result that I just showed you. Now, if you come in now with a switch whose switching window is small enough that it can route one of these signals to a different port, and now if you do tomography, that extracted signal with the help of a switch, you can carve out either that psi one to user one or similarly psi two to the user two. So what this shows is that these kind of switching devices, not only they are noise free, but they are useful in routing quantum information in some kind of a networking environment. And here, uh, if you use that 40 picosecond uh, switching window device, you can run this at very high rates as well. 
OK, so I want to show you. So that was one application of, uh, you know, uh, in this kind of a quantum networking scenario. Uh, and I want to take a few minutes. I don't know how much, uh, how we're doing on time. Okay, so I want to show you another application uh, of these switches in the context of uh, uh, a higher dimensional system. And uh, so previously, what I've shown you is a two-dimensional entanglement uh, in the sense that uh, th these are polarization entangled photon pairs. Uh, so that means that signal idler uh, uh, live in this uh, uh, two-dimensional space. So if you do tomography, that's a four by four uh, density operator. So, but if you create this kind of a time bin entanglement, so let me first define what, what I mean by time bin entanglement. So imagine I have a source that's running at a very high rate. And I carve out, again, at that 50 megahertz every 20 nanoseconds or so, four pulses. Uh, that are, uh, uh, that each are uh, 100 picoseconds apart. Uh, so, so this signal here is 400 picoseconds, but the rep rate of that is 50 megahertz. Every 20 nanoseconds, this signal comes. But now if this kind of a pump pulse is used to create spontaneous Fourier mixing in this piece of fiber, then if a particular photon pair is scattered, you don't know whether that got scattered in the, by the light in the first time slot, or the second time slot, or the third time slot, or the fourth time slot. So in the end, you end up getting a state that is a superposition of these four modes, uh, four time slots, so to speak. And clearly, it has a certain wave function. So the question is, uh, this kind of a uh, state now lives in a, a four-dimensional Hilbert space. And there's no reason to stop at four. Uh, if this is a, a 20 nanosecond timing window, uh, there can be 200 pulses in there. So you could, in principle, scale this up to very large values. In fact, uh, in some other, uh, the record for these kind of time bin entanglement is like 100, 100 time slots, uh, a photon pair living in 100 different states. So here, what we wanted to show was uh, uh, how can we use this kind of a switch to not only create but measure and show that uh, uh, you can uh, use the switch for uh, doing tomography on, on some of the systems like this. OK, so the system is then works the same way. You uh, uh, actually, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong fiber here. This, I should be pointing at this fiber where the spontaneous scattering is occurring. So this part here is preparing the pump. So previously, uh, we were using a mode lock pulse train. So what is happening here is that you start with a CW light. You phase modulate that, and then you amplitude modulate. So by doing that, you create a very strong chirp periodic chirp on this uh, CW light, which then can be compressed by using the dispersion of this dispersion shifted fiber. And this train that leads to a, a pulse train like this, which you amplify. And so here is that uh, fiber, the same one that I showed you previously. This is a Faraday emitter here. And out come these two channels, which have uh, signal Eigler photon pairs in this uh, encoded state like this. OK. So there is a not, they're, they're completely analogous time bin entanglement and polarization entanglement. So you can think of uh, the polarization entanglement between the vertical and the horizontal polarization states uh, called horizontal as mode A, vertical as mode B. But these two modes can be time slots that are separated in time but have the same polarization. So you can, in fact, map all the states uh, of the polarization superposition onto the, to the modes of the signal idler photons. But doing it in this time slot allows you the possibility of going from AB to ABC and ABCD and so forth. So then uh, in order to do tomography on this, you have to uh, make joint measurements. So if you have four time slots, then you have to make joint measurements on 16 different combinations by 
overlapping uh, these individual time slots and then carving them out and making measurements on those. And that's where the switch comes into play. So uh, here's the apparatus. Uh, let me just uh, go through this. So if you have a uh, time slot like this, because our measurement system is a polarization-based measurement, so we convert time bin entanglement pairwise into polarization entanglement, and then we make measurements, and then you, s then you uh, run over different time slots. So what's done here is that you come in with a, a pair of time slots, uh, you split them into two pieces, uh, use uh, polarization rotators to turn one horizontal and one vertical, recombine them, and then put delay in, uh, in one path relative to the other, and then you use the switch to carve out that, that middle portion, okay? So that will then, you converted those two time slots into polarization, you send it to your polarization tomography, and then you use time delays to do all the 16 combinations. Okay, so how does the switch work? Uh, so here is, uh, again, that switch, uh, which is a full crossbar switch. You have a signal coming on channel A, uh, idler coming on channel B, and, and they may be uh, tuned in terms of the delays differently because in this case, uh, depends on what's being tuned. But without the pump pulse, you arrange such that there are filters that block this light, okay? And when the pump pulse comes in, and these two signals are aligned here, channel zero with two and one with two, so that this A input shows up here, but now it passes through this filter. This B comes over here, it passes through this filter, and you isolate that particular pair of time slots. Time delay converted into polarization entanglement, and then you send this into your tomography system that we've used before, okay? And then you do it 16 times, and assemble all the data and reconstruct the tomography, and this is what you get. So this is the singlet state created uh, with this, uh, uh, this kind of a state. This is the real part and imaginary part, and you can compare that with the experiment and theory, and it works reasonably well. Okay. So here's an, an, an application of this switching device that allows us to do high-dimensional entanglement measurements. And uh, uh, so I want to wrap this up to leave some uh, questions. Uh, but uh, let me ask you again, if there is more time, I, let me, uh, there is some backup I want to show you. There's another, uh, so here's a uh, Q-trait. So instead of uh, using four slots, you use three slots, but you can put phase shift on one of those slots by means of a phase modulator. And you do the same thing, and you can see that uh, in the case of a three, if you change the phase, all these elements invert. So basically, this kind of a switching system is quite flexible uh, in creating this time bin entanglement. Not only just that, that you know, the singlet, that, that uh, superposition state I showed you before is not, uh, is not unique. You can pick any arbitrary combinations and you could phase shifts on different time slots and so forth. Okay, so I think I'm gonna wrap this up and take some questions. So in conclusion, uh, we've, sh we've demonstrated a very ultra-fast uh, switching fabric. It is based on Chi-3 nonlinearity in fibers. But of course, Chi-3 exists in silicon photonic systems and uh, you know, many of, uh, in fact, I didn't talk about today, that early work on um, using the Chi-3 nonlinearity of fiber was followed up by the nonlinearity of silicon uh, and uh, other uh, kind of uh, semiconductor substrates. And many different systems have been shown uh, on chip scale format that do spontaneous FOVA mixing. In fact, the very first experiment, again, was done in my group that laid the, the foundation for that kind of work. Uh, but I have not really uh, shown that here. Similar kind of substrates can be used to create chip scale switching fabrics uh, of, of this kind. Again, we're using fibers because that's the infrastructure we have, uh, but no one to my knowledge has demonstrated uh, chip scale uh, devices uh, to do this kind of uh, uh, high-speed switching. Uh, 
And there are good reasons, perhaps, uh, because in chip scale devices, the requirements on pump are much more stringent in switching than they are in spontaneous fold and mixing. Uh, and that's a detail that I can talk about if anyone's interested. Uh, but uh, this kind of a system has a negligible in-band noise. We've demonstrated high-speed operation. Uh, you can multiplex, demultiplex data streams. Uh, if you envision some kind of a quantum network, uh, then users have to you know, define what these quantum streams are. Then they need to be uh, sent from one destination to another. Uh, and the switching fabric, uh, the, you know, the routers that we use in, in the classical network, similar versions of those need to be, need to be developed in, uh, for some kind of a quantum network. Uh, and then I've shown you some applications of that in uh, high dimensional uh, tomography of these kind of switches. Uh, and uh, the, the switch that I showed you has about uh, uh, losses not as low as 0 0.2, 0 0.3 dB per switching cycle. And the reason is that circulator that is used in the Sonyak geometry. But if you go to uh, a, um, a Mach Zander geometry, uh, and this is some work that's been funded in an SBIR to that company that I mentioned before, uh, it is possible to have switching devices that have similar performance, but the per cycle switching loss is as low as 0 0.2, 0 0.3 dB. And then uh, you know, it becomes possible to do some kind of a, a buffers uh, for uh, quantum data holding, packet holding while uh, if, uh, you know, in the network there is contention issues and so forth. So, so I think I want to stop there and take some questions. Okay. So any questions? So for the optical switching, it seems uh, the synchronization of uh, pump pulses with uh, time being cubed is, uh, will be very important, right? And if you have a network of that, uh, you will have to, do you have to synchronize the whole network for all the switches in there and also the time being qubits? Uh, so the question is uh, that how important, it, it seems that uh, in this kind of a scenario of time bin entanglement and uh, aligning the pump pulses, the timing information over the network will be very important. And my answer to that is uh, that we already do that. If you look at the, how the classical networks work, this kind of a synchronization is already done. Uh, you know, the clock recovery systems in you know, 100 gigabit per second system already give you synchronization to picosecond time scales. So I don't think that's an issue. It's, it's a requirement. Uh, but um, uh, the quantum networks uh, uh, will, will be at least two orders of magnitude slower than classical networks. So all the, all the infrastructure of classical networks can be, can be utilized. And in fact, if you look at some of the demonstrations, in fact, a network demonstration has been done in China. And they basically engineered this kind of a, a so these fiber sources and utilized this high speed signal clock recovery and everything to, to demonstrate uh, entanglement distribution. So. Okay. So I have a question. So I mean, uh, right now the people actually demonstrated 100 gigahertz electro-optic switching. There's a recent paper. So can we use electro-optic switching for this kind of networking, or do you think it has to be an optical? So, uh, so I didn't show it here. Uh, if you look at one of those papers, uh, we we plotted uh, a chart of all the switching technology, including this electro-optic switching. The question is. Uh, uh, if you use bulk devices, then uh, in-band noise can be pretty small. But if you use uh, some of these integrated devices, it, it remains unproven that the in-band noise actually is pretty small and that you can get the speeds. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of work going on in lithium niobate on silicon, uh, but I think uh, many of those uh, devices need to be tested. Uh, in terms of whether they are suitable for uh, direct switching. Uh, in terms of, uh, as I said, in-band loss, in-band noise, and preservation of entanglement with other channels that are not in interacting in the switch. So um, 
Yeah, I think it's, it's possible. Many of those uh, Chi tool based devices on silicon look promising. Uh, so I think the jury is out on that. And so for the, the, the system that the China put in satellite, these are all optical switching? On those are bulk. I mean, okay. everything is bulk there. It's, okay. uh, and the rates there are pretty small. I don't think there is any optical switching there. Okay. Uh, and I'm not even sure if they have any switching at all in the satellite. Okay. So they have this uh, uh, Sonyak Loop Chi 2 periodically pulled crystal that I, I showed you. Uh, and they, they align those uh, the light coming out, spontaneous parametric down conversion light onto these collimators. And these collimators then po are pointed to our stations, basically, as the satellite is going. So what is important is the tracking. So I think uh, uh, these quantum channels, uh, along with that, there are beacons, uh, which are at different wavelengths, that do the alignment. And then once they align, then they, they use the quantum channel. So, uh, so it's a you know, pretty well-engineered system from yeah. that perspective. Questions? No, I think we're also kind of about time. So let's okay. thanks uh, Professor Kumar again. Thank you.